Every day, we strive to preserve traditions that have spanned generations. Around every turn of the bayou, Mother Nature reveals unique people, places, and experiences. And the bounty of animals and fish. Well, in Louisiana, we just call that land yak. I'm Don Dubuque. I'm Chris Lacombe. I'm Captain Martha Spencer. Join us as we document the adventure, sportsmanship, and heritage that make us Bayou Wild. Nearly a year has passed since Hurricane Ida rocked the town of Grand Isle, Louisiana. To this day, there's still work to be done to rebuild this barrier island community. This is Louisiana's last inhabited barrier island. Grand Isle wasn't here. Lafitte and New Orleans would have been hit even harder than they were from Ida. But history has shown that no matter the setback Louisianians have endured, fishing industries have progressed. There's oyster farmers and there's oyster fishermen. Is that the same thing and is it required to be? Well, there's really no actual wild reefs. Even the so-called wild oysters or what are caught on the bottom, you still are putting that shell there. So there is a little bit of you know husbandry and farming involved even in maintaining a bottom reef and causing oysters to you know, reproduce and um, repopulate. We just are a little bit more specific about it and we put the oysters in the cages, not on the bottom. So whether it's on the top or bottom, it still is farming. This is Louisiana's last inhabited barrier island. We kind of take it upon ourselves to be defenders of the coast. And if Grand Isle wasn't here, Lafitte and New Orleans would have been hit even harder than they were from Ida. You have to stick together down here because if you haven't experienced trouble yet, just wait. Like, it, it's coming, so we have to rely on each other. We're down here in Grand Isle, Louisiana, a place hit very hard by Hurricane Ida, but things are bouncing back and we're here learning all about the oyster fishery and about farming oysters right here in our backyard. Today we're going to learn a non-traditional way of oyster farming, a process that involves a much more scientific approach to harvesting these salty delicacies. This is kind of what's left over of the oyster nursery that we had. Uh, before the storm. Uh, but normally we would have bottles in each one of these slots flowing seawater up through there feeding the oysters. And you can look in this tray where the discharge is just from flowing the seawater you can see all the little baby oysters that, that stuck in here. When we spawn the oysters and the oysters are ready to set we introduce them to sand that it's basically ground oyster shell that's 250 to 300 microns. So it's only big enough for one oyster to attach to that one grain of sand. And that's what allows us to have the individual oysters that we put into the cages. So I was born in Northeast Ohio on the Great Lakes and grew up fishing and seeing my grandpa go on deep sea fishing charters. He'd always, him and my grandma would always go to Jamaica and they'd bring back sailfish and he had sailfish mounted on the wall and a mackerel and a tuna. And, you know, I always looked up to him and just wanted to fish in, in the ocean. You know, that's, that's, it was just kind of like my dream growing up. And then over the course of time, I end up coming down to New Orleans to do relief work after Katrina, just doing volunteer. After being in the city, 
being basically landlocked for you know two years with that project, I ran down to Homa. I was like, I got to get by the coast. I got to get by water. Started working with the fishermen down there, and I had this really old boat. I was trying to figure out if I could sell like five dollars a crab, like at the dock. I didn't know how any of this stuff worked. I just wanted to like supplement my habit. You know, I just wanted to try to figure out how I could get some sort of gas money some way. That led me into fish and oysters and then just really getting curious about like, how do they reproduce? How do they get here? They don't move, you know, and what, and then the more you study it, you realize there is no downside to oysters. They protect the coast, they improve the water quality, they sequester carbon, you know, and they're edible. Before visiting the oyster farms, Scott shared information on the science behind oysters, a process state biologists refer to as alternative oyster culture. And a lot like agriculture, oyster farming begins with seeds. This is some of the seed that died in Ida. But what we would normally do, we don't have any live seed to show you right now, but as the oysters grow, this, this is the individual oysters that set on the small grains of sand. And as the oyster grows, we start running it through different sieves like this, let the small stuff fall out the bottom, and then catch the larger oysters as they grow. That's mainly what we do until it hits market size. Well, I was a huge biology nerd in high school. It was probably my favorite science class to take, but I didn't know how much I could actually learn about oysters today and how much there was to learn about mollusks. One adult oyster filters, or it basically, you know, breathes about 50 gallons of water per day. Just one adult oyster. So you start having millions of oysters, it really has an impact on the water quality. This is baby food for oysters. This is where they start making algae that is grown for the oyster larva. And these small jars will be transferred into the larger algae production room right around the corner. So from the little bottles of algae, it comes into here and they grow bigger volumes of algae to feed all the tanks of larvae and the brood stock and everything else. There was a lot of science in it. Um, I ended up having a lot more questions than I thought I would, and all of them were answered. Um, I could probably ask another dozen if I sit here thinking long enough. These are the mommies and daddies. But if you, if you look at them, some of them are open. See, so they're, they're feeding. So that algae that we saw in the other room will be pumped into this water to keep them alive. And this water in this tank is chilled. And basically what they can do in this tank is mimic different times of the year. So you can, you can mimic different times of the year. So we're trying to make them think spring's coming earlier right now. And we can spawn them faster that way. So there's, there's two different types of oysters that we actually raise. One is a diploid and one's a triploid. The diploid is what occurs naturally in the wild. And it has two sets of chromosomes. A triploid has three sets of chromosomes, and that's achieved by taking an oyster that has two sets, breeding it with an oyster that has four sets. When they get together, it makes an oyster that has three sets of chromosomes. It's a triploid. It grows fat and fast, so it's a natural product. It's more like taking a horse and a donkey and making a mule. of our plots here in Grand Isle. Um, we put, like this location right here for two reasons. Uh, first of all, you can walk it. It's fairly shallow, so we can get off the boat and work it pretty easily. And secondly, right past that bridge is the Gulf of Mexico, so we get Gulf of Mexico clean water fresh coming in 
right in the pass. And you can also see we get a lot of wind down here, which rocks the cages and gives the oysters their signature shape. It's a three finger oyster, yep. but that's kind of the size that the restaurants want. That's about the size of a soup spoon. So that's, you know, that, that's the size of meat that we're looking for. I, I learned of kind of the, the process and the delicacy of, of shellfish, uh, how long they take to grow and all the variables that go into making a good oyster or growing a good oyster and what we have control of and what we don't. There's a lot of factors that affect the taste. The fact that we have them up off the bottom, oysters eat just algae, they eat phytoplankton and most of the photosynthesis happens in the top two feet of the water. So by raising the oyster off the bottom, putting it in a floating cage, you're giving it the best food. It doesn't have to fight the sediment to get its food. Um, so. I think it does result in a cleaner taste. Because they have a thinner shell, you can use a thinner knife to get in there. And to me, they're easier to open once you kind of understand how to open them. You get more understanding of where your food comes from and why it's so good and why it's so important to just support the industries that are so close to home. Yeah, I mean it was literally right out of the water. But. How salty? How salty was it? I mean, what am salty I? Salty or salty, salty or like salty, salty, salty? If that was chilled, it would be perfect. Yeah. Like perfect. I mean, it's you know, it's it's kind of like water temperature. You like yeah. it colder. Yeah. But the the like very salty. We're gonna actually tell you how salty these oysters are. We actually measure how salty the water is. So today it looks like it's right around 30 parts per thousand. Which is good. That's salty. Yeah. yeah. That's real salty. That's real, that's salty salty. Yeah. I wasn't sure if I was just, you know, blowing smoke saying it was a really salty oyster because it was coming right out of the water. But indeed, we, we did a little salinity test and found out that any oyster you get this year is gonna be a really, really good one. Seven months post Hurricane Ida, and we're here down in Grand Isle. I'm going to show you what this and this have in common. Yeah, so th this is this is the traditional way of of planting oysters: is you throw limestone or shell back into the water, and in this case, after the storm, we have tile and storm debris that we throw back out there. And when the oysters get milky, that larva will swim around and look for something to attach to. So that's why it's important that put the shells back into the water or put limestone or something for them to attach to. And this is my neighbor, this is Mr. Floyd Lasang right here, and he's taken this out a few buckets at a time to put on his lease. So any kind of debris that fell into the water could, you know, potentially be a home to a new reef. Who knew there was so much science in oyster farming? The struggle to keep oysters thriving requires a balance between the natural and the innovative. I guess just educate yourself and teach yourself about the environment. It, it works together so much. I'm starting to forage sea succulents on the island that I never knew were here. Um, so it goes beyond oysters. Find something that you like and learn about it and do what you can. Everybody has different things that they enjoy, so just do, do your part. Coming from somewhere else and living in Louisiana, again, continuously uh, teaches me about where my food comes from. And that's been from the fish I catch, to the deer I shoot, to the birds I hunt, 
And, and now even the oysters and the shellfish that we raise here, which is something I didn't know much about, um, we've covered everything now from soft shell crawfish to how they harvest oysters the new school way, which I think is a very productive and interesting way they do it. I call the waters around here magical. You know, when, when the water's right, I mean, the oysters just taste amazing. There's fish going all over the place. It's just, it really is just, there's no place like it. So next time you eat a fresh Louisiana oyster, think of the dedication involved, keeping our adventure, sportsmanship, and heritage by you wild.